And thank you so much, everybody, for coming out on such a cold day. And uh, it is uh, Bridges Day. It is uh, in bulk. It's not just Groundhog Day. So it's the first day of lambing back in Ireland and Scotland. It's also the day, traditionally, when the sap starts running in the roots of the trees. So it's actually the first real day of spring. So two weeks from now, people would be starting to tap the trees. And uh, so even though it doesn't look real spring-like out there, it actually, things are stirring in the ground, which is where spring really starts to happen. So here we go, spring. Um, yes, my sister is here with me as well, my sister Robin, who is a horse whisperer, magic woman person. And uh, she and I have been farming on the East Shore for... 60 some odd years and I say that very loosely because we moved to our farm where we live now in 1954 um, from a different farm um, which we still call the Manorino place even though it hasn't been owned by the Manorino since 1946. <laughs> but it's funny how farm families name things and then the names stay in the family. So we have names for places within our family that only we understand. So if I say to Robin, oh, Bone Bay, she will understand what I'm talking about, even though nobody else will. And my brother and my other brother will also know, and they, we will know the story that's attached to Bone Bay, even though nobody else will understand what we're talking about. So First Nations people also name places like that, but farm families do the same thing. We have names for almost everything on our 80 acres of land. And uh, only we understand what we're referring to when we talk. And there's a story attached to each of those names. So yes, we've been here for a good long time. Um, so I'm a farmer. I'm also a writer. I'm not a historian. Um, but I am deeply, deeply interested in history, and in particularly in the history of the East Shore um, and in farming, because farming is something that I think is deeply important. I think... Right now, given the history of our times, that one of the most revolutionary and radical things you can do is not go to a big chain grocery store. Just don't go to the grocery store. Grow your own food. Don't walk in the grocery store. I can't actually remember the last time I bought an orange or a banana. And uh, Robin confronted the manager at the <laughs> overweighty the other day over the fact that the only peppers... We do occasionally buy red peppers and avocados, and the only peppers in the grocery store were from Israel. And uh, so, but a hard time buying red peppers. We very proudly walk through the produce section most of the year in Overweighty and don't buy anything because we have a freezer and a storeroom full of food. So, in terms of agriculture and what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon, one of the things that is very important to know about the history of agriculture on the East Shore, and I'm going to be talking about that term, East Shore, and what it means, because it's a very shifting term, is that although the East Shore has been responsible for a huge amount of agriculture where produce was produced, and then it was sold, and it was shipped all over the world, but in fact, subsistence agriculture, where people grew their own food, or they sold it to each other, or they put it aside, and they fed themselves has been an incredible part of the East Shore agricultural history right from the early 1900s really up until now. People are still growing their own food and uh, in the early 70s when there was this huge back to the land movement that lasted for almost 20 years, subsistence agriculture was enormous and everybody was busy discovering how to make tofu and cottage cheese and so on and so forth. So Subsistence agriculture has also been a big part of the agricultural movement and the agricultural history of the East Shore. So I'm a writer, I'm a farmer, I've been part of agricultural history on the East Shore for 60 some odd years. Um, so what I want to talk about this afternoon is um, four, well, three things, and then I want to end with a conversation because everybody here has their own sort of little piece of history of agriculture and farming on the East Shore. And also, I know that there's always a certain amount of anxiety about agriculture and food right now and the history 
not only the background of agriculture, but going into the future. So I'd like us to have a chance to have a bit of conversation about that as well, because I think that's very, very important. And because I have five grandchildren, and because I spend a lot of time looking at what's going on now and what's going to happen in the future, I would love to hear everybody's point of view about agriculture now, agriculture into the future. Um, but first I want to, so we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about three things. I'm, first of all, I'm going to define some terms. I'm going to define these four terms and what they mean in terms of the discussion this afternoon. Um, secondly, I'm going to look at the uh, four main areas along the East Shore in terms of agriculture and um, what those areas did. And so that, is, for me, is Sirdar and Boswell and then uh, Crawford Bay and then uh, Kootenai Bay. And then I'm also going to talk about my and my sister's and my brother's experience on our farm um, which still exists and is still a producing farm. We have a huge garden every year, we have fruit trees, and we're constantly looking at new ways to, um, I mean, I'm 64, almost 65, so, and I'm crippled with arthritis, so for me, gardening is always an interesting adventure, and I'm always getting people to help. But we still produce an astonishing amount of food from, you know, our farm. So I'm going to talk about our experience there over the last six years, and then I'm going to open it up for conversation. So I want to talk about these terms right now. First of all, the term pioneer and what it means. Everybody has an image when you hear the term pioneer, and you think of pioneer as something that's happened or someone who was you know, far away in this long ago, kind of misty, person sort of, you know, chewing down trees and putting up cabins, um, you know, digging up um, gardens, whatever they were doing. But the word pioneer is very interesting because, again, it's a very shifting term. What, what is a pioneer? A pioneer, the word is actually French. It means pionier. It comes from the word um, pied or pion, which means foot. So a pioneer is someone who makes a road. It also comes from the word peon. A peon is a slave, a peon also is a foot soldier. So a pioneer is someone who walks. A pioneer is someone with feet, basically. A pioneer is someone who is a soldier. So the word pioneer in French means foot soldier. So a pioneer is someone who goes ahead, who makes the road, who opens the way, that's all a pioneer does. So a pioneer isn't necessarily someone who makes a garden or who grows food. A pioneer has nothing to do with that. A pioneer is simply someone who opens up a way. So that's what a pioneer is. So a pioneer can be a pioneer in any era, at any time. A pioneer is somebody who does something new, who opens a way for other people to come behind him or her. So you too can be a pioneer. All you have to do is think of a new way to do things or open up a way for other people to do things who follow behind you and say, oh, isn't this a good idea? Let's do this, right? So anybody can be a pioneer. But we usually think of pioneers as A, white, <laughs> and B, people who came into what they thought of as a new country. It wasn't new at all. I've been here for you know, millennia, but they saw it as new and they saw it as empty, even though the First Nations people were here and having a fine time. Um, they weren't too happy when they first saw David Thompson. Um, there's a really good story about David Thompson when he first <clears throat> came over the mountains. He came over in 1806 into Inver what's now Invermere. And then he came down looking for the Columbia River. He came down the Kootenai River and followed the Kootenai River into what's now uh, approximately to where that, what is now Port Hill, ran into the Tanaha Indians there, asked them what was north on the Kootenai River, and they said, oh, don't go there, you won't like it. It's all swamp and rapids and boulders and it's horrible. Um, go back the way you came. And they didn't tell him <laughs> about Kootenai Lake. And uh, they lied to him, basically. And then the, it was May, and the mosquitoes were howling, and they sent him back through what is probably the Moye River, nobody knows for sure, 
and they sent an Indian guide with him who left him, and then he stumbled back, he got lost, and uh, I'm making this quite a long story quite short, but what essentially happened then was it took him a whole year to get down the Columbia River to the mouth of the Columbia, claiming the, the whole way for, you know, the Queen, for Queen Victoria. But when he got to the mouth of the Columbia River, John Jacob Astor had already got there and built a story house. So essentially, the main reason why Oregon and Washington are not parts of Canada is because of the Tanaha Indians at the mouth of, or at Creston. And I asked them about this one time, and the Tanaha historian woman who lives in Cranbrook looked at me and she said, he called us swamp people. <laughs> and she said, we're not swamp people, we're water people, which is what the word Tanaha actually means. And they're still mad about it. Anyway. <clears throat> so, what that, so what does the word East Shore mean? So again, we have this shifting word. So pioneer, someone who goes over ahead, East Shore. So Kootenai Lake actually at some point went all the way to what's now Port Hill. Right? So my mother used to catch the stern wheeler below Creston. Used to get on the stern wheeler at what used to be Junction Machinery, which is now closed. And she used to catch the stern wheeler and she used to ride it to Balfour and then they would catch the train to um, what's now Castlegar and then they would take the stern wheeler up the Arrow Lakes and then she would get off the stern wheeler at Nakasp and go to visit her father. And what she loved about that ride was what she called, and excuse me for my language, was the darkies. And she said, oh, the darkies, they were so kind. Because, of course, it was a CPR stern wheeler. And the darkies were the wonderful black guys that they hired to serve on the CPR stern wheeler where they had beautiful linen tablecloths, silver sterling table service, beautiful china, and these wonderful tall black men who waited in the dining room and were so kind to the little children. And my mother just thought they were wonderful. But it, that, in those days, they were called either Negroes or, in my mother's parlance, and that was in the early 1920s, the darkies. And she thought they were the kindest people she'd ever met in her life. So those were the days of the stern wheelers. And the stern wheelers were an absolutely wonderful form of transportation. So the East Shore at some point ran from Port Hill to wherever, for our term, Crawford Bay. But then the people who came over the mountains and took one look at that huge area of swamp below Creston decided right away, it's got to be dikes. Look at that. It was called Canada's Nile, Canada's Egypt. If we dike that off, we'll have some of the most fertile land in the entire world, which was absolutely true. So they started diking it right away, and it washed out, and they diked it again, and it washed out, and it was finally finished being diked, I think it was 1946. And they had some of the most fertile land in all of Canada, still is. The Crescent Flats are incredibly fertile. But they, discovered, they began growing peas and wheat, and then they discovered... And I've never quite figured out why, that you can't grow wheat on the Creston Flats because the amount of protein in the wheat isn't high enough to, to make um, animal feed. And you can't grow hay for animal feed on the Creston Flats either. But you can grow other things. You can grow canola, you can grow all kinds of things down there. It's a wonderful, wonderful land. So the East Shore now, for our purposes, runs really from Sirdar to Crawford Bay. You could almost include Windle in there because of Duck Lake. Duck Lake was never part of the Creston Flats, even though it was supposed to be included. But as my wonderful friend Dick Staples said, them duck people heard about it. <laughs> so it was, a lot, it was deeper because of Duck Creek. It was deeper than the rest of the Creston Flats. So it was the last portion that was supposed to be diked off. And then the duck conservation people heard about it and decided that it should become part of the wildlife area. And that was in the early 50s. And so Duck Lake was never diked off and became part of 
instead of being Kootenai Lake, it became what is now known as Duck Lake, which was originally known as Sirdar Lake, but then they changed the name to Duck Lake. So now, for today's purposes, the shore runs from Sirdar to Kootenai Bay. What does this term mean? The moving human baseline syndrome. I love this term. I think it explains everything. I'm using it constantly all the time. All my friends are bored to death with it. <laughs> it means that when you are born and you wake up and you look at the world, you see the world and you think this is the world as it is and as it always has been. And you think this is the world as it is. It's normal this way. And you have a really hard time understanding that the world was once different. So then you come to some place like the East Shore and you look at it and you go, oh, the East Shore has always been like this. You know, and you drive along the East Shore and what do you see? You see old houses and you see mountains and you see trees. And you say, oh, look at this wonderful wilderness. So people come to our farm and they go, oh, isn't this beautiful? It's a wilderness. And what Robin and I do is we look at them and we scratch our heads and we think, how do we explain to them that what they're looking at is second or third growth logging, that in our lifetimes we've seen roads be pushed out every creek valley, that we're looking at a lake that's been dammed, that the fish have died in, and that in the 60s was a swamp because it was full of uh, fertilizer from the concentrator in Kimberley. Um, we've seen so many changes we, when we were kids. Every animal in the valley was shot, killed, trapped. Our father shot everything that moved. Um, there were no ospreys in the lake. There was no fish in the lake. Um, there was no eagles. There was no hawks. Everything has changed. It's moved and changed and moved and changed and moved and changed so fast and so much. And so when people come here now, they look at it and they go, oh, isn't it beautiful? And so then people who come and they have a summer cottage and they're sitting in August and they, oh, it's so beautiful, we should move here. And I look at them and I say, spend a winter. <laughs> Just spend a winter before you decide to move here. Because, of course, in February you think, the sun will never shine again. <laughs> it will never come back. You know, the cloud lid comes and it sits over the lake, as we all know, and we don't see the sun until the end of March and you think you're going to die the sun's never going to shine again right and your brain has a really hard time remembering that in August it will be really really hot it will be so hot that you think oh winter winter will be nice <laughs> so you know your brain fixates on what is now is normal but in fact, the East Shore has changed so fast and so much in my lifetime that sometimes I have a hard time when I drive from the ferry to my farm and I pass houses and I think, oh, so-and-so used to live there and so-and-so used to live there and so-and-so used to, and oh, it's changed. It's moved, and, you know, and it it's actually can be quite difficult. And I'll end up at the farm and I'll just be in a state of sort of moody nostalgia because so much has changed and shifted in my lifetime. So that's what is meant by historical amnesia. So historical amnesia actually is a bit more specific than that, though. Because So I have grandchildren who are two, four, and six. So my grandchildren will never know someone who lived through World War II. So history dis living history disappears within three generations. So written history then takes over. But living oral history disappears unless it's written down. So what happens, even if it's written down, is that it fragments, right? So I'm very, very glad that Robert is taping this today because then the tape will survive and it will continue and someone three generations from now will be able to hear me and see me talking about history. But history disappears very, very fast. I encourage everybody in my writing classes to write a memoir. Because if you don't write a memoir, your great-grandchildren will know very little about you. So historical amnesia goes along with the moving human baseline syndrome, so that people who come to a place know very little about it. And often, surprisingly enough, they're not very curious about it, which actually drives me a bit crazy. It drives me crazy that young people who move here don't come and say to me, how did your grandparents 
My grandfather bought our farm in 1938. How did they farm here? What did they do? How did Pierre Langeval, who first, you know, farmed my farm, what did he do? How did he manage? How did he, you know, do? How did, how did he pioneer your place? But I'll talk about that in a bit. So now I want to move on to the actual regions of the East Shore and the kind of agriculture that people did here. So I want to start with Sirdar because Sirdar is a really interesting place. Now, Robin and I went to school in Sirdar. Not many people know now, um, everybody used to know, that Sirdar had a one-room school. So it had seven grades there and one teacher. Our teacher was named Hazel Hare, and we loved her dearly. She used to come to school with her dog, and she would come at 9 and leave at 3, and the school bus came at 8 and arrived at 4. So we had an hour completely free of supervision every morning and every afternoon to play. And Sirdar was a railway area, and it was built by the railway, so there was seven, there's only three now. There used to be seven um, railways, and there was a turntable, and there was a water tower, and there was a beautiful, beautiful um, railway station. And um, so that was our, our play area. <laughs> and we were always told, don't play on the railway trains. So, of course, the minute you tell kids to not play on the railway trains, where do they go? And um, <clears throat> we used to have a big crabapple tree that we went and we hollowed out under the crabapple tree, and that was where we had school in the spring as soon as it got warm enough. Mrs. Hare allowed us to move outside and have school under the tree. Sirdar was a staging area to move the trains onto barges at Kootenay Landing. Now, does everybody here know where Kootenay Landing is? Anyone know, not know? Okay, so Kootenay Landing, um, the, the railway goes across the lake at Kootenay Landing and then down the west shore of Kootenay Lake. So at some point, Kootenay Landing, the trains, the railway stopped there, and the railway cars were loaded onto barges, which were towed by the sternwheeler to Balfour. And then when they were loaded back off the barges and onto the railway and turned back into a railway. So Kootenay Landing, if you go out there, you can walk along the railway tracks just below what used to be Amasco. It's shut now. Amasco is dead. Um, they've moved out of Crawford Bay. Um, but you can walk along the railway tracks out to Kootenay Landing. You can barely see anything there now. There's a piling. There's the remains of the old terminus. There used to be a hotel there. There used to be a huge sternwheeler landing site. It was enormous. Um, and people would land there, get off the sternwheeler, and then they would come to Sirdar. So Sirdar had seven hotels, and it was a huge town, and it had a newspaper. <laughs> and Sirdar was sell settled by seven Italian families who came from one village in Italy, a little village named Patilia Palacastro. And so there was the Pascuzos and the Sherbos and the Manorinos and the... Oh, God, I'm not going to remember them all. Um, anyway, the reason why Sirdar has all of those beautiful terraces, stone terraces, is because all of these families came and then they turned Sirdar into an Italian village. Mm -hmm. And they settled the hillsides and they built all these beautiful... Um, stone walls, and then they planted huge, huge orchards and grapevines and prune trees, apple trees, prune trees, grapevines, and incredible um, produce, which they then put on the um, railway and shipped to the coal mines in the Crow's Nest Pass. And they made a lot of money. Sirdar produced huge, huge amounts of fruit. And there was one fellow named Jimmy Manorino who nobody liked because he was a nasty little man. And I know he was a nasty little man because a friend of ours named Mike Haynes knew him well. And he got into a fight with Santo Pascuzzo. And Santo Pascuzzo was the head of this group of Italian families. So Jimmy Manorino moved three miles north of Sirdar to the Manorino farm 
And the Manorino farm is the place that my, our grandfather bought and gave to our mother and father, Robin and my mother and father, as a wedding present. So that's why it's still called the Manorino farm. And it's three miles north of Sirdar. So Sirdar is one of the places on the east shore that was a, one of the most productive fruit and great grow, growing areas in on the east shore. And interestingly enough, um, just south of Sirdar, in below the highway, some of you will have seen it, Windlebox and Lumber has set up a new grape winery growing area and it's had its first crop of grapes and its first batch of wine and it seems to be very uh, productive and it's won an award and it's doing extremely well. So that was Sirdar. So Sirdar was extremely um, good area. And then the next place along Kootenai Lake Sorry, Scott. The next place along uh, Kootenai Lake that's really important in terms of fruit growing was Boswell. Now, nobody knows where Boswell is, right? <laughs> I mean, Boswell used to be, before the post office screwed it up, it used to be where the, it used to be Road 1 Boswell, where we all got our mail. And then for some reason, Canada Post decided that Boswell but that wasn't good enough. For some reason, I now live in Cuskanook, even though I phoned Canada Post and said, no, I don't live in Cuskanook. Cuskanook is a mudslide. And they said, oh, well, you know, if you have to phone the, the fire and tell them where you live, they'll know that you live in Cuskanook. And I said, well, there's no fire engine. Um, but they, anyway, it's Canada Post. <laughs> so, okay, where are we? Yeah, so Boswell was an amazing place. So Boswell was settled by... British expats who came out to Boswell because they thought they were so, they were told in Britain that Boswell was this beautiful community and when they came to Boswell they would already find that there were houses and families and it was all settled and they would find people there and when they came to Boswell they were they found there was no such thing but you know being British they kind of went oh well oh, oh, put it on must you know, and so they got to work and they built houses and they cut down the trees and they pulled out the stumps and they began to plant orchards. And one of the things they discovered is that Boswell is indeed the banana belt of Kootenai Lake. Now, one of the things that you may know or you may be discovering is that Kootenai Lake has many, many climactic zones all the way along it. Crawford Bay is much colder than Boswell. Where we live, our farm is on the edge of the Boswell banana belt. And one of the reasons for that is because of the glacier, and it's also because of the shape of the lake. Um, just going back to Sirdar for a moment, one of the places where the snow melts fastest is on, uh, just in that corner. When you come down the hill into Sirdar, the, what's left of the Pastuzo farm, it's always warm. And the cows up there have their calves on that beautiful slope, and the sun melts in there. That is a really, really hot it's because of the way the hills bend and the sun comes in there and that is just a hot, grassy slope. And the people who first came along Kootenai Lake really, really knew how to read the weather. And that Pascusa place is an amazing sun catcher. It's just, it's shaped like a bowl and it catches the sun unbelievably. But Boswell is the same. It is one of the best tree fruit growing areas along um, anywhere. I had an agriculturalist say to me that one of the best places in the world for growing fruit is Basel because of the climate. And, it, and one of the reasons is because of the temperate climate in the winter. And people don't think about the fact that fruit trees have to have a temperate climate in the winter. Their roots can only stand so much cold in the winter. It's one of the reasons you can't grow peach trees in Crawford Bay is because their roots can't handle the cold in the winter. And so um, we can grow peach trees at our farm because they won't handle anything more than minus 10 through the winter. They just, the, the, the tops look perf perfectly healthy, but the roots freeze. So Basel became this amazing fruit growing area. And what used to be the Mackey farm, it's no longer, there's just some cows up there. Um, Lord, or the, what was his name? 
the fourth Earl Grey, Sir Albert Henry George Grey, who was the Governor General of Canada, came in 1906 and bought a big piece of land and he named it. So he decided to name his place the Boswell Ranch and it was um, next to the Johnson land. Now, there's two stories about why it was named Boswell. One story is that he stepped off the boat and he said, oh, waho, the Johnson land, let's name it Boswell. And that's because Samuel Johnson wrote a, a memoir called, you know, The History of Boswell. But the other story, Larry Briley insists that it's because of Lord Kitchener. Now, nobody remembers Lord Kitchener, but there's a whole bunch of names in along Kootenai Lake that commemorate Lord Kitchener's campaign in Europe, or in Egypt, rather. So we have Kitchener, and then we have the railway junction, just the site of Sirdar, which is named Atbara. We have Sirdar itself. Those are all named after Lord Kitchener. Who knew? Did you know that? No, you didn't. Do you remember Lord Kitchener? No, you don't. But here he is. <laughs> and you're all sitting at Grey Creek, named after who? Earl Grey, there you go, who named Boswell after Boswell, who may or may not have been Kitchener's adjunct, or whatever you call it, sergeant or adjutant or something. Anyway, Kitchener had a helper named Boswell. So there, there's two reasons why Boswell got named Boswell. However, we do know that Earl Grey named Boswell Boswell for whatever reason he did. And so he bought this huge chunk of land and he began, he planted 2,000 fruit trees on it. Can you imagine? And then he imported a man named, what was his name? Alexander Mackey from England to be his helper. And Alexander Mackey planted cherries and Cox's orange pippins. Does anyone here know anything about Cox's orange pippin apples? Well, they're not delicious. They taste like wood. They're keepers. Why were they valuable? Baseball? You could ship them? You could ship them. You picked them in, you know, late September, early October, and they were tough as nails, and they tasted like wood. And you loaded them on the stern wheeler, and then you loaded them, and they went on the freight train, and then they went across the prairies, and then they went on the big ships, and then they went across the ocean, and then they went to England, and they got there at Christmas, and get what they, guess what they tasted like. They tasted fantastic. And they weren't bruised, and they weren't rotten. They were brilliant. And they could withstand that journey. And they were just delicious. And the queen ate them. Boswell apples. So isn't that amazing? And they grew Gravensteins. Gravenstein apples. Who here eats Gravensteins? Aren't they the most delicious apples ever in the history of the world? And they don't keep worth shit. <laughs> but you know they make the most amazing juice and they're just the make most amazing pies and nobody grows them anymore because they don't keep so they planted um, Cox's orange pippins and Jonathan's and Graben seeds and they also planted raspberries and, and gooseberries interestingly enough and strawberries and all these soft fruits and then they built this huge packing shed and a big wharf down where the wharf is now and so they had this enormous packing shed, they had a big cooling shed, and Boswell was just producing enormous, amazing amounts of fruit. So when you drive through Boswell and you look up in the mountain and all you see is trees, what you're driving by is miles and miles and miles and miles of dead orchards. Right? So there, once again, is your historical amnesia and your moving baselines. And what you're not seeing is families, British families, old orchards, and women down there in the packing sheds. They built their own boxes. They packed the apples. They put them on the stern wheeler. The stern wheeler came every day and took the soft fruit and shipped it out. A lot of it went to the jam factory in Nelson, got made into jam. I mean, Basel was just shipping mountains and mountains of fruit. 
One of the things that, or several things happened to the East Shore, and it happened very quickly. And one of the things that happened to Basel was the completion of the railway along the other side of the lake. And then the Sternwiller started to come once a week, and then it stopped coming. And then a, a bunch of other stuff happened to Basel as well. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but essentially, the population of Boswell just dropped, and that was the end of Boswell. So I want to talk a little bit about Crawford Bay, because Crawford Bay looks like a golf course. <laughs> the golf course was once a series of 10-acre small farms, which used to produce amazing amounts of Potatoes, it was essentially a small, a series of small truck farms, small garden farms. A lot of the produce went to Nelson, a lot of the produce went um, on Sternwheelers, a lot of the produce went to Riondo. Don't forget that Riondo was a huge, huge mine. And it was, you know, madly working and shipping out um, ore, and it needed food. And so... Um, or Crawford Bay was interesting because it was initially um, settled in, in 1895. And so one of the things to know about these shore, if you think about it, is all of the um, places where people have settled are all estuaries, right? So they're all creek estuaries. So that's what Crawford Bay is. It's just a, a big creek gravel bank. And so the land is gravelly. All of the land where people have settled is essentially just an old floodplain. So Crawford Bay, that's what it is. It's another Crawford Creek floodplain. And so <clears throat> people settled there, and they made a living mining, and they made a living hunting, and they made a living trapping. And then I think it was in... Oh, hang on. Yes, in 19... In the early 1900s, someone came along and subdivided all of the area that you now know as the um, golf course. That was all 10-acre plots, and people bought them up and began producing land, or producing food. And a lot of it was shipped on the stern wheelers. And again, Crawford Bay was this huge land-producing area. And I'm very sorry that Susan Holland isn't here, because she would know a lot more than I would about Crawford Bay and Kootenay Bay. And then again, you have, um, there's a wonderful series of books that some of you may have read, or all of you may have read, called Dorothy Stormy Lake, about um, Dorothy Graham Brown and her wonderful place um, at Kootenay Bay. Actually, it's between Kootenay Bay and Riondo, and she and her husband, um, what was his first name, Robin? Robin. Robert Graham Brown settled there, and their history of pioneering on um, along the area between Riondo and their incredible strength and raising children. Um, they used to have to row their boat to Ainsworth in order to go to Nelson. You think about rowing across Kootenay Lake in order to go get grocery stores. And one of the things about the East Shore, going to, back to that whole notion of self-sufficient agriculture, is that the East Shore is essentially a peninsula, right? So it's sort of an island. It's a very, very long peninsula. So in the old days, going out to the grocery store, I mean, it's difficult enough now to catch the ferry to go to Nelson. In the old days, people got around by rowboat. There was no roads. There wasn't even, for a long time, even a mule trail between Crawford Bay and Great Creek. People used to row from Crawford Bay or from Kootenay Bay to Boswell to visit. So then you would stay overnight, visit your friends, and row back. The stern wheelers were great because they could come up on any beach and all you had to do was put out a sign or put out a flag and they would, because they had such a very, they drew such a low volume of water. So you could get around by sternwheeler and you could ship your produce by sternwheeler. 
So the stern wheelers were an absolutely amazing way of transportation. The problem was, and here again we go back to history, they used so much wood that they stripped the wood off the mountains right to the very top. So now I want to talk a little bit about our farm and then open it up for questions. So our mother and father initially farmed on what's called the Manorino Place, which is just north of Sirdar. The Manorino Place had a wonderful orchard, had a wonderful creek, had a huge garden. It sort of consisted of two sets of benches, and the top was quite fertile because it was an old creek. It was kind of a, a creek bench. Um, and so they had um, fruit and they had cattle, but the problem with the Manorino place is mosquitoes. It sits above, um, you know, flooded, just just above the end of Kootenai Lake, and the mosquitoes come out of there on a warm June, July night. You can actually see them. They come out of there in black clouds. So it was a miserable, horrible place to live, and um, they had little kids. And so in 1952, they reopened the Bluebell Mine, and my parents moved to Riondo. And then, but they hated Riondo, and they hated working in, my dad hated working in the mine. So in 1954, 55, we moved to our farm where we are now. And they basically invented subsistence organic farming before anybody had ever thought of such a thing. And my parents loved farming. The problem was the rest of their relatives made fun of them for being farmers because in the 50s you were supposed to move to the city and you know live in suburbia and get a house and get a job in a factory so everybody in our family basically laughed at them for wanting to be farmers but they were brilliant farmers they were amazing we had a herd of cows we had two milk cows we had pigs we had chickens we had i don't know pretty much every kind of animal you could have and everything on the farm fed everything else. And so what my father had as workers is he had four children. And it never occurred to him once to not ask us the minute we could move or pick something up to simply go to work. So we did everything from the moment we could walk, basically. We did everything that there was to do alongside him. So we did, we used to cut hay at least twice a year, and so we picked up loose hay with pitchforks, loaded it on the wagon, took it to the hay barn, loaded it in the hay barn, all with pitchforks. And we did this when we were like five, six, seven. Um, I remember running up to the uh, hay field one time, and I was in a hurry, and I grabbed the pitchfork, and I was going to use it to jump with so I could go faster and I jammed it and I jammed it right through my foot and I looked down and I thought oh my god dad will be mad and I yanked it out and kept running because we weren't allowed to be sick we had never had time and so we just worked and we grew up my my brother says that he thought his name was get wood (laughs) so there was always chores to do and you know, we had to uh, feed the cows, we had to get water for the chickens, we had to gather eggs, we had to, had to, had to, had to. But the amazing thing is now, and all of us talk about this, is how proud we are of how strong we were and how hard we were. And we were, we were proud of it then, and we were proud of how tough we were. And uh, we used to kind of make, well, kind of, we used to make fun of the, uh, my grandfather made a, subdivision beside our farm and the town kids used to come out in the summer and go swimming and we used to make fun of them <laughs> and we all had guns and they didn't and, <laughs> and so they used to come over sometimes we'd be shooting at beer bottles in the lake and they'd come over and stand and watch us and they'd say can we touch your gun and we'd be like no get away <laughs> So we grew up wild, and we grew up tough, and we grew up hard, and we grew up knowing that, you know, if you could get away from Dad and get out in the woods and run around, then you could have a good time. And we grew up on the lake and in the lake and in boats and fishing, and we just, we had a wonderful, wonderful time. We always had pets. We had pet wild mallard ducks. Our dad one time brought us home. He came in the house, and he... 
um, brought a cap full of wild, he'd seen the mother duck get killed on the highway and he brought out his hat and it had was it four or five wild baby mallard ducks. And we kept those mallard ducks with forest, around us for years. They lived out in the pasture. So, um, yeah, everything on the farm fed everything else. And we had a huge garden. Our mother canned, I think, around 300 jars of fruit and vegetables every year. So, our, interesting enough, when I said earlier that Robin and I avoid the grocery store, when we were kids, we resented like hell our father saying, don't buy oranges, don't buy bananas, you know, don't go to the grocery store. We thought, what does he know, that old fool? And now we walk to the grocery store with our father's voice in our ears and we don't buy groceries and we don't buy bananas and we don't buy oranges. And we say, oh, our father was right. <laughs> so we still live on the farm. We still grow food. We still put a lot of it away. Um, I have the most wonderful deal. My friends, Freddie and Yvette Schenkel are here, are here and uh, we have the best bargain, I think, ever made in the history of farming. I grow food and they can jar, dry, jam. <laughs> we, it goes back and forth between us and we never ever try to figure out who, who's getting the best of the deal and it, it works great. It, partly because my hands are so crippled so I can't peel peaches and tomatoes the way I used to. So Yvette does that for me. And you know, that's the way farming works. My mother and father, whenever someone came to the farm, they always left with something. They left with a box of apples, or they left with a couple dozen eggs, or they left, left with a gallon of milk, or they left with a couple of pounds of butter, or they left with something. Because the deal in farming is that you always make sure that your neighbors are, you know, you're on the good side of them, because you're always going to need your neighbors. And they're always going to need you. So the whole deal with subsistence farming as that you're always trading back and forth. You're always swapping something. You're always swapping help. You're always swapping food. You're always swapping stories. You're always swapping, hey, you know, so-and-so's got some, uh, some... So the other day, I, I, you know, happened to have a frame that I need to put some greenhouse plastic on. So I phoned a friend of mine. He said, oh, yeah, I've got some greenhouse plastic. You can have it, blah, blah, you know, you can have it for free. And I phoned someone else, and they're like, oh, yeah, blah, you know. And so you're always swapping, swapping, swapping. But everything evens out in the end. That's how farming works. And that's how you build community, because community is all about swapping, trading, stories, I used to love to listen to my father and his friends talking because what they were really talking about was, well, you know, so-and-so's got that old tractor and I need this and he's got that and they were always, but, you know, they had to tell 10 or 15 stories about, you know, they were bullshitting, but eventually they'd get around to what they were really talking about, which was... You know, who had what and who needed what and who was going to trade what for what and, you know. So I remember my daughter coming here one time and I said, oh, honey, come with me. I have to do this and I have to go over there and I have to do these chores and I need to visit so-and-so because I need this part for such and such. And she just come from Vancouver and at the end of three or four hours and 15 cups of tea, she said, it's a possible to do anything fast on the east shore and I said <laughs> yeah that's right you can't go to somebody's place and not go down and look at the new fence and have a cup of tea and then go over and see the new baby goat and then you you know but it's all really important work it's part of the job of farming so storytelling, which is what I've been doing today, is part of farming too. It's part of community, it's part of knowing what you're doing, it's part of history making, it's part of knowing your own community and the history of your community and what came. So pioneer agriculture on the East Shore, the East Shore, it's important to know, was at one point in the early 1900s, right through to the 1930s, one of the most important food producing areas in Canada. What killed it was the sternwheelers stopped coming. 
The stern wheelers stopped coming because the railway was built along the west shore of Kootenay Lake, and that killed the stern wheelers. And then what happened was that the 1930s happened, and the Depression happened. They stopped shipping fruit on the railway. Nobody could move their fruit out. Nobody could make a living from growing food. The east shore is too far away from markets. They no longer had transportation. Essentially, what killed the East Shore as a food producing area was lack of transportation to markets. They couldn't compete with the Okanagan. The Okanagan was much closer to Vancouver. The Kootenai still has a huge, huge problem with marketing food, but it's able to grow food in terms of land, in terms of subsistence agriculture, in terms of ability to grow food, in terms of, you know, people, it's still, everything is still here. That's why when people start panicking about the future of food, I'm just kind of going, what? <laughs> I mean, look back in time, look back at the 1900s. What's the problem? The land is here, you know, the, the people are here. What are you worried about? You know, we live on an island. We have subsistence agriculture. Our land, interestingly enough, um, the first guy who, who found our farm was a man named Pierre Langeval, who was French. And he came to our farm in probably 1918. And what he noticed was our, our farm is a big cedar swamp. And there's a sill of granite that runs around what was an old swamp. And there's two or three feet of black muck inside the sill of granite. And he cut the cedar trees down and he had a big gasoline um, sawmill and he turned those cedar trees into lumber and he denuded that swamp of trees, but it is the most amazing soil. And somehow or other he figured that out and he built our farm and that soil is still sitting there. And it has water running through it all the time because it's an old swamp. And uh, it's, that's what our farm is, that's why it's there. So you find these little pockets of wonderful, wonderful land along the east shore. And it's on you know, it's on the toes of the mountains. We're still we're still living, you know, essentially on the toes of the mountains, but we're very, very lucky to be here looking at watching things change. Changing so fast. So I think what I'll do is stop there and we'll open it up for questions. And uh, I think what we should do first, I think there's coffee and tea and cookies, and we'll take a break. <coughs> Is that okay, Laverne? The You're just going to make the... Minutes, so okay. Make well, maybe what we'll do then is we'll ask questions first, and then when the coffee's ready, we'll take a break and come back to the conversation. Yeah, um, it's almost impossible to know. There is no actual place, really. So the Basel Ranch is right above where the Basel um, Hall is now. So that was where the, Bos the Basel Ranch was just to the south of that. Um, but there is no one area that was ever clearly designated as Boswell. So the, the Boswell Hall, the, what was the Boswell Hall, the original Boswell Hall burned down. Um, and the Boswell School and the Boswell Cemetery was all where the, so the Boswell boat ramp is now. So that was the original Boswell. But... The Basel Post Office was delivering as far south as my place and as far north as Burden's Cut. So technically, Basel is... When you referred to the fruit growing of Basel, you meant that bench? That's kind of yeah, it's the bench the above yeah. where the Basel boat ramp is now. There's a really large, flat bench up no, in there. Yeah, that yeah. was all orchard. Hmm. And it was quite huge, and it runs for, for probably three or four miles up in there. Yeah. So you can't see it from the road. But then south of there, what was Mackey's and what's Verna Myers Mackenzie, that was all orchard as well. Right? So there's quite a lot of orchard up in there. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Thoughts? Um, please contribute your knowledge of the history as well. So feel free to add to what I said. When I was driving down the road one time with Johnny Oliver, past your farm, and I think he'd had too much Copenhagen or something, and he was about to be sick, and he asked me to pull over quickly, and in the middle of winter, he just dove into the snow above your farm and found the creek. <laughs> I thought he knew where that creek was. So you're Well, he knew where that creek was because, because he the built snow. the highway along. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he was part of the highway crew when they paved the road. And uh, so he, he knew our place well. And also he and Dad were really good friends. And he and my brother are good friends. And we had a lot of respect for Johnny Oliver. But is that the feed for what was the swamp then? No. <laughs> that creek is actually an interesting story. So Pierre Langeval, who was the man who settled our farm, that creek is actually a diversion from Langeval Creek, which is... Now, he wanted a creek to run through the farm. So he went up the mountain and he diverted part of the creek off Langeville Creek, which of course you could do in those days without asking anyone's permission. And you could still see the site of the old diversion. But by so doing, he caused a huge landslide, which is just south of our farm. And you have to know where it is now to see it because it's been treed over. And um, the story in our family was always that it buried a house, but Nobody that I know thinks that that's true. Um, anyway, the, so the creek that runs through our field and runs uh, down into the lake is a diversion off Longeville Creek, and it actually is probably <coughs> illegal, but nobody pays too much attention because it's way up the mountain. Um, so the creek that runs through the six, it's actually an incredibly deep, you know, muck swamp. Yeah. Pierre Langeval dug and drained it with, and the reason we know this is because my brother went in and dug and put in drain pipe with his backhoe, and when he was doing that, he found the original drain tile that Pierre Langeval had put in, three feet down in this black muck, made of cedar wood, and somehow Pierre had dug down three feet in this black muck by hand, and he had dug and drained that field with cedar boards with it by hand and you know it must be yeah. I don't know how far would that be Robin that field it's a big field mm -hmm. and then Bill replaced it with actual drain tile but we looked at this and thought how the hell could anyone have had the energy to dig down that deep by hand <coughs> and then put in drain tile made of cedar boards <laughs> <laughs> well he was young and then he died in Kootenai Lake. He drowned in the lake. And he must have been so mad about it. I still <laughs> wonder, you know, we've always wondered. Our story when we were kids was that he haunted our house. And I still wonder if he haunts the farm because he worked so incredibly hard to build that farm. But, yeah. Since you've had the opportunity to be in one place for that many years, are you seeing now with climate change, all of those things, that farming is getting harder because things aren't as dependable in the weather? Or, or is it over the long span that things seem like they still happen when you want them to or when they need to for everything else to work? Yeah, I, I watch for that a lot. You know, I, I, I spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time since about the late 1990s reading about climate change. It's something that I've really spent a lot of time paying attention to. It worries me a lot. Um, I don't talk about it much. I haven't seen any stupendous changes other than there's been some big switches. So when I first, I moved back from Vancouver when my dad died to take over the farm in 2006. I've been sort of coming and going every three or four months all that time. And at that point, the springs and the summers were really dry. And we would had a period of five or six years of intense dryness. And now we're having intense, kind of cold, wet springs. And we've all noticed that the springs are cold and wet. So you can't really get out to plant now till May or June. The spring is so cold and wet. 
And I keep assuming that it's going to swing around again. And I keep waiting for those hot, dry springs to come back. So far they haven't. I don't know, it's just the climate is very shifty. And you never know what's, you know, the... I mean, we used to get a big break in February, and now we don't. And it's so... I, I don't know. It's, it's very independable. But it's a totally different thing about Australia. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, it's, it's very... Like, all the old weather patterns are gone. You know, the things that my dad could depend on and he would tell you about have all shifted. So, yeah, it's kind of like, oh, 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 oh. Can we, it, yeah, I don't know. My dad knew the weather so well. It was so funny. The, the summer, what was it, 2004 when we had all the big forest fires? 2003. And so we had 32 helicopters in our field because the, the mountain behind Cuscanet was burning. And he was so excited. He thought it was so much fun. He just loved it. And he was just having so much fun with these helicopter guys. And then one morning the wind shifted. And my dad, he was... What was he, 80 something at that point, 80, 79, 80. And he went down and he said to the crew boss, or he said to the guys, they were all there, and the wind shifted in from the south, and they were just really getting excited because they thought, oh, the fire's going to leap and it's going to go north and we're in trouble now. And he said, well, pack her in, boy, she's all over. And these guys, these helicopter guys, said, what the hell is this crazy old guy talking about? And he said, yeah, you're done, you can go home. And the crew boss was like, what the hell? And of course it was raining by noon. Because he knew the wind had shifted in from the south and it was going to rain. Mm-hmm. And they were all like, how did he know that? You know. But he'd been watching the weather patterns for 80 years. But they have definitely shifted and changed. So I don't know if he would be able to do that now. On the other hand, you know, the fall is warmer, the fall is later, um, Things, are, things in some ways are better. I don't know. I, I really couldn't tell you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question kind of along the same lines with the idea of climate change and peak oil and things that are going to affect yeah. everyone on the East Shore and That's otherwise. Terrifying. Knowing the historical context of the East Shore and knowing the different communities on the East Shore that happened before, what kind of vision would you see on the East Shore now to build kind of a, a bridge so that this community could weather kind of different storms involved with changes that will come through peak oil and climate change? People are doing exactly what they need to do, which is just staying in touch, figuring out how to grow food, keeping the community network alive, talking, having conversations. Um, I was p- very much part of the whole very active back to the land movement in the 70s and the early 80s. It was incredibly active. And we all learned how to do all kinds of things, and then people sort of let it lapse a little bit. Everyone was busy raising kids and doing things and having jobs, and you know, it was kind of difficult to do everything. And a lot of us went back to school or went and got jobs. So I, in my case, I sort of did this thing where, you know, I've been at the farm for 60 years, but when I say that, I line my face up because, of course, I've also gone to school and written books and gotten jobs. and. You know, what I've done is I've sort of beetled back and forth between the city and the farm and the city and the farm and the city and the farm and in order to sort of have a life. And, you know, my parents were at the farm and I sort of just did both. Um, it's, it's hard still to live here. You can't really make a living. You can't really make a living farming. You can't really get a good job here. What I'm watching for, what I'm really paying attention to, what I'm really looking at, is when small farming starts to make money. And in Preston, it's beginning to do that. It's the small pockets I'm really, really paying attention to. Partly because, you know, I have a son and a daughter-in-law and three little grandkids in Preston. 
The farmer's market is going. There's little businesses. People are having juice businesses and cheese businesses and, you know, little this kind of business and little, you know, I'm just kind of going, okay, okay, you know, people are paying attention, people are watching, people are checking it out, people are not going to the grocery store for this, they're willing to pay for, you know, the dairy business in Creston is just booming. I love that milk, I love their cheese, right? People are willing to pay for it, like I'm, you know, and I'm also watching peak oil, like a hot, it's, interesting to me because it's been going is it yet, is it yet, is it yet is it yet, and they keep finding new ways to, you know, they drill holes every 50 feet in South Dakota I mean it's it's a weird one I don't know, I don't have any answers for you but I keep watching it I think what people are doing here is absolutely right keep growing food, just keep growing it, don't stop you know, learn how to do it. I mean, growing food is the easiest thing you can do. You dig up some ground, throw some seeds in it, you water it, poof, stuff. It's amazing how easy it is. Anyone can do it. You don't have to be an expert. Just wondering if you have a bear problem with fruit. And of course, things have changed from when, you know, you used to, oh, bears in the orchard, no problem. But, so, when you can't do that anymore, or people don't want to do that, and we don't want to do that anymore, how can you have an orchard without uh, animal problems? You know, part we've never had a bear problem until the last two or three years. Partly because, yeah, my dad used to shoot bears, and bears are really smart and they're very territorial, and once they learn the rules, they don't bug you, right? And <laughs> I didn't realize, I had some people at the farm one summer who were from Vancouver and I didn't I we were sitting around we were drinking wine and I heard some noise outside and I grabbed the flashlight and I yelled at the dog and I said oh I gotta go out and chase the bears and I ran outside with the dog and the flashlight and said, get the hell out of my palm trees you down <laughs> and I came back in and I sat down and grabbed another glass of wine and they were sitting there going <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't realize that to them what I had just done was kind of insane <laughs> and to me it seemed perfectly normal that I would go outside and chase a stupid bear of the plum trees and because for 60 years we'd either shot the bears or chased them away they only started to really push back in the last few years I think in fact because my father wasn't there <laughs> well, they're really smart. One of the things that I look at in my spare time and read about is animal intelligence. And because my sister and I have seven horses and we spend part of every day with these horses, we have seven horses that we talk about and think about as personalities. Not people, but we have seven horse personalities. They could not be more different Animals are so smart. So now we got a great big dog. And she is the biggest, fiercest, meanest dog in the valley. Because we got a bear problem. And we have a deer problem. I and mean, we never had a deer problem. And we got a cougar problem. And it's when my father was, and all of our neighbors were living there, we had a neighbor named Wally Johnson who was a trapper. And my dad and Wally, between them, they shot cougars, they shot bears, they shot owls, they shot hawks, they shot ospreys, they shot deer, they shot coyotes. Because the pioneer mentality was that if it was a menace, you killed it. So I remember an osprey biologist saying to me one time, didn't you have ospreys on the lake when you were kids? And I said, of course we didn't have ospreys. People killed ospreys because they ate trout. There was no ospreys on Kootenai Lake when I was a kid. I beg to differ. There wasn't. Remember the huge <laughs> nest at the north end of the Manorino place that you can see from the, the corner below? That came later. That osprey nest was there when I was young. Wally well, shot every osprey that moved because they ate trout. Anyway, now we ate bear and we ate deer. 
Dad had a six volt battery with a headlight up in the corner of the barn. And when he put the hay out at night, he would go sit up there in the barn with the rifle. And he sold the beef in Riondo and we ate deer and bear. <laughs> <laughs> I never ate bear. <laughs> I remember us eating I know, bear. But <laughs> <laughs> so yes. We're now because of the resurgence. Nobody has. I exist to contradict my guns, We have an animal problem, so now we have this giant white Akdash Marama cross doggy, and we're trying desperately to teach you the difference between a coyote and a human being. <laughs> you can chase the coyotes. Please don't chase people. She's slowly figuring it out. She's very she smart dog. She will never fight anybody. No, she doesn't she bite. She will definitely scare the Jesus out of you. <laughs> She's a great dog. Yes? We had a friend that spent quite part of his life trying to keep bear from hives. Yeah. And actually, we found out the only thing that worked 100% is electric fence. Yeah. And bear learn really, really fast when you have electric fence and you can put some yellow tape or whatever that they would see and then they would associate that and teach their young. But yeah, but it is interesting now to see the resurgence of wild creatures on the East Shore. I mean, we have far more raptors, like hawks and eagles and osprey than we used to have, and hawks and owls and bears and cougars. I mean, the cougar population is interesting because there never used to be cougars. And I'd far rather have cougars than deer, quite frankly. But not everybody agrees with me on that. So, and, and that's quite interesting. And watching people come back to their places for their you know, two week or three week sojourn in August, there's some cabins next door to us. And the bears routinely sort of move in there because it's quiet and it's solitary. <laughs> And then the people come in August, and they're like, there's bears! <laughs> well, and the bears are like, there's people! <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a bit of an argument there every year about who's supposed to live there. But of course, then the people go away, and the bears are like, what was that all about? Who are those people anyway? Why just come back? Yeah, good point. And I, I think that's also happening in other parts of these shore as well. I think there's... Oh, yeah. Bears in Bright Creek, oh, yeah. and bears in Proper Bay, and cougars, and all kinds of you know, more wild animals around than there used to be. So, you know, you have to either fence them out or get something, some way to. I think fencing, I think electric fencing, I think bear dogs, the dogs that will chase bears, whatever you have to do to keep them out and not shoot them is something that's going to be part of farming in the future, rather than just shooting everything that moves, which was the pioneer mentality. Yeah? Another change, I think, that plays with that is uh, like the forests themselves coming back. Oh, yes, kind of absolutely. Having that edge closer and closer to our orchards as well. Like yeah. just where we live there. An orchard is a clear cut, and the forest is just like, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. You know, the forest wants to come back, and it wants to regrow, and it wants to take over. No question that nature wants to take over. It wants to come back, and it wants to boot you out, get you the hell out of here, and turn everything back into a forest. That's what it's meant to do. And, you know, a farmer works both with nature and against nature. You have to fight it off if you want to be a farm. A farm is fighting off, <laughs> you know, all of those things that want you to be just a nice forest. So you have to go out there and, you know, burn and get your chainsaw and dig things up and, and then at the same time you're trying to be really nice and love nature. And, but at the same time you're like, get the hell out of here! No, no, I want to be a clear cut and I want to dig up the ground and the minute you put a shovel in the ground, you create an insane amount of problems because every thistle of weed and, you know, wants to just come and grow there and make everything nice again. So, yeah. Being a farmer is a hell of a job. <laughs>
Yes, dear. I think about the uh, history of farming and how people come into the country and had to feed themselves. They had to farm to eat. Yes. And then how the economy evolved and people discovered it was much easier to have a job and take a paycheck and go to the store and buy food. And so farming became buying food instead of feeding, instead of growing your own food. Farming became too much work compared to going off and having a job. Then the dawning awareness amongst people that the stuff in the grocery store isn't as healthy, healthy as we thought it was. The takeover of corporations and and monsters like Monsanto that are changing what we have to buy. The growing awareness amongst people in small groups, especially agricultural country like our valley, to realize that if we want to stay healthy, we have to start to look after ourselves again. Well, the thing is, farming isn't... The thing I get, where I get, where I get kind of stuck is everybody says, oh, farming is so much work. We did it, and sometimes it was work, and sometimes it wasn't, right? So nobody ever says about a lawyer who works 70 hours a week, oh my God, being a lawyer is so much work, right? So sometimes farming was a lot of work, and then sometimes we just went to the beach, right? We never worked 70 hours a week all the time. It's a lot of work when you have a job and you have to come home. And then and do farm. A farm because the farm doesn't support you. Yeah. But if you're just a subsistence farmer and you're growing your own food and you have a little trickle of money coming in from somewhere, <laughs> God knows where, then it's not so bad. But you do have to, the problem is you have to have a little itty bitty, itty bitty, itty bitty. What itty I'm saying is I think there's a growing awareness amongst people in a grassroots movement that are realizing that if we want to grow quality food and not genetically modified garbage that we have to learn to look after our food sources. Yes. And on that note, I think the coffee's ready. It did not come from these shores. Coffee's not from these One of the things we're going to have to do is we'll have to learn how to trade for coffee. Because no matter what we do and how many green houses we put up, we'll never be able to grow coffee here. Yeah. And we'll never be able to grow, there's a few things we won't be able to grow. Sugar. Well, we can maybe grow honey. I've actually laid awake at night and thought about the things we, you know, we'll have to trade for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three things. Oh, Magic coffee beans. Magic coffee beans. Can I ask one more question before yes, you go? Yes, of course. Know the is important, but any thoughts <laughs> on the relationship between government policies and farming these days? Well, government policies at the moment are no help at all. Um, the worst policy the government has ever come up with is the policy of not allowing farm gates, gate sales for homegrown food, and especially homegrown meat. And so when my father was a farmer, he used to drive to Riano about once a month, and he would sell milk, <coughs> butter, eggs, meat, um, what else, fruit, apples, vegetables, apples. apples. And because he'd been a miner in the Bluebell Mine in Riano, he would go from house to house, and he would visit with every single person in every single house, and it would take him all day, and he would sell everything he had, and then he would come home again. And he loved Riondo, and he loved everybody in Riondo, and they loved him. And, but he sold, you know, he didn't have to have anybody's permission to sell all of that. Mm -hmm. And everybody loved to get his produce, right? And he sold raw milk. We grew up on raw milk. My kids grew up on raw milk. He sold raw milk to everybody. And then the government told him, I can't remember what year it was, that him selling raw milk to his customers was the equivalent of manslaughter, that he would go to jail. And he came home and he cried because he was so proud of his cows and he kept them so clean and my mother was so fussy and sterilized everything and no one had ever gotten sick from his milk and it broke his heart and he sold his cows and that was the end of that. The very worst thing the government ever did was to make the sales of raw milk and homegrown meat 
and homegrown whatever um, illegal. So people should have a choice, and they don't have a choice right now, in order to buy, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I cannot sell a, a homegrown chicken to my neighbor. That's completely illegal. You know, I can't kill a chicken, a feather chicken. So there's other policies to government. You know, they, they sort of wink at some things, but, you know, I can't go and, and make a, a batch of cookies and sell them at the farmer's market without getting permission from the health officer. You know, and I mean, in Vancouver now, if my grandson has a birthday party at school, I can't take home, homemade cookies to his birthday party. They have to be bought at a grocery store. Yes. So, you know, yes, the policies that the government is making are completely support big agriculture and against, are against small farmers. And it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. So, in the future, I think what we might end up doing is simply breaking the law. And the government, the problem is then the government will have a choice of whether to prosecute us or not. I don't think they will because I think sooner or later people will simply have to produce their own food and sell it to each other. That we won't have any choice. Well. Personally, I think that one of the things that may happen is that we kind of sold on the idea that the things that are produced industrially uh, help you, save you, and whatnot, but they are not. And eventually, if there is enough people that start complaining and saying, what are you saying there? I mean, this is total nonsense. It is not true that what is sold by Campbell's soup is better than the soup you could make in your home kitchen or uh, things like that. But you're going to have to have mass amount of people complaining for this kind of thing to change. And of course, you have to realize that all the industry, they rely on benefits. Yeah. So if you start buying uh, things that are processed, and the more processed, the less we should buy, you know, then eventually they are going to have to change. But it's going to take an enormous amount of complaining. It's not going to happen just by chance. You know, and we're going to have to have things quite, you know, set. But, you know, we refuse to have more um, policy toward uh, the industry because, you well, know, it's a big corporation and they have money and they have... Uh, um, a support inside, you know, and it's easy for money to change pocket, you know, when all those things happen. But uh, without an enormous amount of public outreach, it won't happen. And you have to realize that the tobacco company own most of the food industry. Yeah. Most of the food industry are owned by Philip Morris. They realized that the writing was on the wall and they were not going to make money on cigarettes, so they pulled the food industry. Hmm. I didn't know that. And they certainly are not interested in our health, you know, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> that's the last of us. Okay, let's take a break.